I will only say that I do not know if human misery can be portrayed with more realism than to see so many people leaving in such confusion with the cries of women and children so burdened by obstacles and difficulties. And truth be told, if these people have sinned, then they are paying for it dearly. Don Juan de Austria, letter of 6 November 1570. Hello, let's continue our journey with the valiant Hidalgo and his savvy squire. Chapters 54 and 55 of the second part of Don Quixote are crucial to understanding Cervantes' art of the novel. Here, more than anywhere else, our author combines two symbols. First, the ass as the mistreated human beings of Apuleius' anti-slavery picaresque, The Golden Ass. And second, the cave as a state of unenlightened philosophical ignorance in the political allegory of Plato's Republic. First, note chapter 54's ridiculous subtitle, which deals with the things pertaining to this story and no other. It's absurd and comedic, but it also signals this chapter as fundamental. Ironically, the narrator cuts from Sancho Panza's abdication of political power to events at the Ducal Palace. It turns out that the Duke's vassal, whom Doña Rodriguez wants to marry, her daughter, is in Flanders, a subversive allusion to Spain's most costly imperial adventure in the Low Countries, where Cervantes' own brother, Rodrigo, had died in battle in 1600. So a young lackey named Tosilos, a reference to Toxilo, a slave in Plautus's play The Persian, must take the vassal's place in the juice with Don Quixote. In stark contrast to Sancho Panza's tragic reaction to the invasion of Barataria, Don Quixote is now eager to prove the valor of his mighty arm. Then, we switch from the Ducal Palace back to Sancho Panza. Notice again Cervantes' inclusive use of the first-person plural. Let us let those things pass, as we have left other things pass, and go join the company of Sancho, who, both happy and sad, came riding atop his gray search of his master. Here, Cervantes confronts her fallen governor with the great moral and political issue of the day the expulsion of the Morisco population from southern Spain, which had taken place between 1609 and 1614. Now we understand the reason for the weird state of Sancho Panza's letter to Teresa way back in Don Quixote, chapter 36, part two. Did you know? The idea behind did you know is that there are things you need to know. Leaving Barataria, Sancho Panza meets six pilgrims who ask him for alms. Note that the narrator cites Cide Ametes' description of Sancho Panza as charitable when he gives the pilgrims bread and cheese. When they ask him for money, speaking German, Geld, Geld, he indicates with signs that he has none. German foregrounds the issue of the Habsburg Empire. At this point, the novel's major Morisco character appears and from the ground, he hugs Sancho Panza about the waist, recalling Sancho Panza and Don Quixote in the Fooling Mills episode. Speaking perfect Castilian, in a clear and very Castilian voice, the man recognizes his old friend. Is it possible that I have in my arms that great friend of mine, that good neighbor of mine, Sancho Panza? At first, Sancho Panza does not recognize him, and Cervantes uses this problem to emphasize the Morisco theme how is it possible, Sancho Panza, brother, that you do not recognize your neighbor, Ricote de Morisco, the shopkeeper in your village? Now, Sancho Panza hugs him back in a notably awkward way. Without dismounting, he threw his arms around his neck. Three points here. First, Ricote and Sancho Panza are neighbors, apparently good friends. Second, Sancho Panza indicates that Ricote is in danger if he is discovered. If they catch you and recognize you, it will go very badly for you. Third, and finally, the Morisco is a shopkeeper. Cervantes signals that the expulsion of the Moriscos has been morally tragic as well as economically devastating. Ricote and his company are friendly. They are very amicable folk. Sancho Panza and Ricote leave the royal highway in order to converse. In private, Enricote tells Sancho Panza that which happened to me after I left her village in obedience to the decree of his majesty, which threatened the unfortunates of my nation so severely as you know. 
this is huge. Some historians put the figure of expelled moriscos as high as 300,000. The justification of their expulsion was formulated in terms of the Machiavellian reason of state. Spain was threatened externally by the Turks, and the Moriscos were considered internal enemies, a potential fifth column. If Cervantes saw the expulsion as necessary, and this is hotly debated, then at the very least, Ricotte represents an exception that calls the policy into question. He is Sancho Panza's neighbor, but his name also refers to the Valle de Ricote in Murcia, famous for the loyalty and Christian faith of his Morisco population. In fact, these were the last Moriscos to be expelled from Spain. They were initially granted an exemption, and only when the local oligarchy insisted on expropriating their property were they finally sent to the Barbary Coast in 1614. The ironies of this scene are thick. First, Ricote and his friends are the antithesis of Pedro Recio. They offer Sancho Panza a generous banquet, complete with bread, salt, nuts, cheese, ham, olives, and even caviar which Cervantes describes in detail. They also offered a black delicacy, which they say is called caviar, and is made from the eggs of fish. Quixotic Mission Which imperial action was most costly to Spain around 1600? A. The war against the atheistic Borg. B. The war against Protestantism in the Low Countries. C. The war against Sunni Islam. Correct answer, B, the war against Protestantism in the Low Countries. Finally, on one hand, the Moriscos only suck the ham bones, which hints at their Islamic beliefs. On the other hand, they go against their faith by drinking a lot of wine. But what most won the day on that field of a banquet were six wineskins, for each of them took one from their saddlebags. And then, straight away and all together, they raised their arms with their wineskins in the air, with their mouths on the openings and their eyes fixed on the sky. It seemed no less than they were aiming at it. Note the painful contrast between sharing a meal and being at war, between drinking wine and aiming guns. The irony continues as the narrator cites a popular ballad about Nero, who watched how Rome burned, in order to describe Sancho Panza, who suffered not from anything. This contrasts our governor as a potential tyrant, with our squire as much as, as such a friend of Moriscos, that he does not worry about being a Roman Catholic. It even turns the Inquisition's attempt to burn people like Ricote back against the institution, because by violently betraying Christian ideals, what gets burned is Rome itself. And at this very moment, Sancho Panza joins the drunken orgy. He asked Ricote for the wineskin and took his aim like the rest of them. Next, Cervantes reveals the political bond between Spain and the German House of Habsburg as a lie, a sign of hypocrisy. Our old Christian squire bonds with the Morisco hosts, who, for their part, pretend to be Germans. Notice that both Sancho Panza and the Moriscos speak the Mediterranean lingua franca that was so important in the captive's tale of chapters 39 to 41 of the first part of Don Quixote. Now and again, one of them would grasp Sancho's right hand and say, Español y tu de esquí, tuto uno bon compaño. And Sancho would reply, Bon compaño, jura di. The Moriscos mean Spaniards and Germans united together. Good friends. Sancho Panza means good friends, I swear by God. Note also how the following description of Sancho Panza subverts war and government with laughter and feasting and he fired off volleys of laughter for an hour, forgetting all about what had happened to him during his governorship, because her cares have little jurisdiction regarding the timing and duration of food and drink. Finally, note that Ricote speaks perfect Spanish. Ricote, without the slightest sign of his Morisco language, addressed the following words to him in pure Castile. Is this a man who deserves expulsion? That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating text. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.